Okay, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, so welcome everyone to part four of the NERI GSC Research Tools Workshop Series. Um, I'm particularly excited about uh, this talk as it's very pertinent to my research, um, but I'm very excited about all of the talks that we've had so far. This is our second to last in the series, and so we'll invite you at the end to join us for our final in this workshop next month. Um, this workshop has been a joint effort between um, myself and my vice chair of research, as well as the NERI GSC uh, working group um, about uh, workshops and mentoring, as well as NERI Sim Center. And so um, I'd like to welcome all of you today to our talk on simulation of regional hurricane impact using Sim Center tools. Um, the NERI Graduate Student Council um, is an initiative that's a that's a bit over a year old at this point. Um, it's a very it's been a very exciting initiative for myself and all of those who have been a part of it. We've uh, been excited to build a diverse graduate community for natural hazards researchers, connect with mentors in the community, um, and hear from some brilliant facilitators in these types of workshops. Attend these workshops, encourage DEI conversations learn about the impact of research on practice um, in natural hazards, and finally gain valuable leadership service and funding opportunities. For those of you who are not maybe not part of the NERI GSC yet, I wanna strongly uh, encourage you to get involved and join. As I said, it has been a valuable opportunity for those of us who have already been a part of it. We have a number of exciting initiatives, a few of which we'll talk about at the very end. Uh, for those of you who may not be members, this is the QR code to join and we'll repost it at the very end. And even for those of you who maybe are not graduate students but would still like to become involved, there are tons of ways, whether it be giving a talk at a meeting, um, facilitating a workshop like this, um, or, other, or anything else. And so if you'd like to support and get involved, please let us know. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's workshop in the Research Tools series. Uh, I'm so excited for this talk. Um, Dr. Steven Gabrilovic is a digital risk and resilience engineer at AIRUP and part of the risk and resilience team in San Francisco. His main research is on IRIS, a digital platform for risk and resilience analysis. In addition, he is the lead developer of HAPI, a multi-hazard API for quantifying natural hazards across the globe. Dr. Gavrilovic is also a part-time software developer and postdoc at the Neary Sim Center at the University of California, Berkeley. At the Sim Center, he's the lead developer of the Regional Resilience Determination Tool, also known as R2D, which is employed to simulate the performance of urban regions subjected to different natural hazards. As you can see, he's very well qualified to give today's uh, workshop on R2D. He was also involved in the development of OpenSRA, a seismic risk assessment tool for natural gas infrastructure. And he was and he received his PhD and Masters of Applied Science in Civil Engineering from the University of British Columbia, specializing in structural and earthquake engineering. Really quick, I would just like to ask um, that all questions be held until the end, just to give our speaker plenty of time to demonstrate everything he'd like to show. And I'd also like to remind everyone that this uh, session is being recorded for future reference, as well as to share this with others who are not able to join us today. Um, Stephen, I'd like to now turn it over to you. I thank you very much. Now let me share my screen here. Uh, hopefully you can see it now and you can see the slides. And can you see everything good? Yes. We're good? Okay. I'll just jump to slide. Perfect. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this workshop. My name is Steven Gavrilovich. I won't talk too much about myself. Today did a great job introducing me. Thank you. Uh, basically, I work at Arup now. I've been at this uh, Sim Center for the last two and a half years, and maybe the last six months, I think I've transitioned over to the RNR team at Arup in San Francisco. I'm excited to show what RTD has to offer today and hopefully it can help your research. So I won't spend too much time here because it is recorded, you can always come back to this, but I will steal that QR code idea with the slide instead of these links, I think it's a much better solution. But anyways, you can always go back to this uh, page in the recording and you'll see some links here for the tool webpage, the documentation, a QGIS documentation, you'll see why that's important in a few minutes here. 
In the GitHub page, RTD is completely open source. So both the front end and the back end, all the code is sitting there. And then there's lots of instructional videos on the Center website where you can go and uh, watch some, uh, what are the workshops I've given in the past and, and training videos, that sort of thing. So here's a quick overview of RTD to give some background. It's essentially a combined uh, geospatial processing tool uh, for multi-assets, so in this case, buildings, lifelines, and I mentioned the natural gas pipelines. We're also doing water pipelines now. Uh, and then multi-hazards, so we support earthquakes, hurricanes, and then tsunamis. And we are working to bring in other modules for lifelines as well. So if, you know, if that's part of your research, it would be great to work with you and, and bring things in. So as I mentioned, RTD is open source. It should be extensible, which means you should be able to come in and plug your own code in. Our backend is completely in Python, uh, as it's a very well-supported language. And I guess a lot of research is done in Python. Uh, and the way it works is we'll have a, we have a front-end user interface. So that's what I'm going to show today in a demo. And then the back end is basically code. So the front end will create an input file, uh, and that will be fed into the back end. You'll run the processing in the back end, and then the front end will digest that again. And I'll argue why the front end is useful for developing those input files and helping you select the type of assets you want to analyze or to set up your you know, research question. And <clears throat> if you're an expert, you could jump right into the back end. You could create your own JSON input file and change things in Python there and run the back end separately from the front end. So here's where R2D fits into the whole Sim Center framework. Uh, I guess I'm not the first presenter from the Sim Center, so I'll, I'll skip what the Sim Center is per se, but I'll give a description of the framework and kind of where R2D fits into the whole picture. So whereas these some of these other apps like EEUQ, WEUQ, HydroEQ, they focus on single buildings. So you have earthquakes, uh, what are the say response of a structure due to earthquakes, due to wind, due to some sort of hydro loading. And then that gets fit into our performance-based engineering application to calculate different decision variables like cost and downtime and so on. And then finally, R2D generalizes all of these apps to a region. Whereas these are for a single building, we consider hundreds of thousands of buildings. And that's also important because another fa important facet of R2D in this regard is you're able to run things on the high performance computer, which we'll get into later to do these large analyses. But it takes all this other hard work kind of under the umbrella to do that. There's also a few other apps we have, which are very helpful. There's Brails, which uh, allows you to construct a building inventory that can be used in RTD. And QuoFem, which is kind of our uncertainty quantification methodology, which is sprinkled throughout each one of these apps. So here's that kind of extensible framework I talked about, and RTD pretty much touches on each one of these puzzle pieces in, in its workflow. So you'll see there's asset characterization where we describe our inventory over a region. There's hazard, we describe our hazard, right? In different ways, I'll highlight some of those ways. Uh, there's asset and event representation. So how do we link our asset to our hazard? You know, our hazard could be a raster, or it could be a grid. How do we you know, know what to sample, which point to choose? And then there's response estimation. You could have a, say a finite element model, or you could just take the intensity measure from the hazard and use that to estimate your structural response. And, and similar, similarly with performance assessment, you know, we can have a open C's or open C's pi model, or we could just use the intensity measure uh, as their simple EDP into our fragility functions to calculate damage and loss. And finally recovery, where we wanna simulate the recovery of a region uh, following a natural hazard. And here's a quick description of how that graphical user, user interface looks. Uh, this is that main input panel I talked about. So this is QGIS. Essentially, I took the QGIS platform plugin and, and put it into RTD. So all the power, I should say most of the power within QGIS is available in RTD. So it allow you to filter the assets according to different attributes. So you might wanna only analyze, let's say houses with a gable roof and then compare houses with like a hip roof. I'll show you that in a minute, but there's different ways you could filter these assets, select the ones you want to analyze and then send them forward for analysis. Uh, I'm going to describe this panel selection ribbon next, and this just goes through the different panels. So when I click through these, uh, you'll see how this main input panel will change. 
And another important part is this program output. So as you're going through R2D and putting in these inputs, you'll want to watch out here. There'll be error messages or status messages telling you kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And there's two ways to run R2D, uh, locally and remotely. And I'll get to that in a minute too. So here's just a quick uh, summary of what this panel selection ribbon means. So each one of these acronyms stands for something else. So we have visualization, that's our GIS kind of main screen. Uh, general information, I'll skip over that one. It's kind of describing the, the analysis in very broad terms like name, description, so on. And then we have our hazard definition, our asset definition, our hazard to asset mapping, our asset modeling, analysis, uh, damage and loss, uncertainty quantification, any random variables that come in into our UQ, and, and then finally results. So there are 10 examples built into RTD. Uh, I'll show you how you can import them. And each one of these uh, touches upon a different part of, of the platform. And you'll notice there's like recorded ground motions, physics based ground motion, ground motions that were taken from the NJOS database. Uh, for today's demonstration, there's uh, different hurricane databases that I'll show you in the back end where we could simulate our own hurricane. I'll be, show, I'll be doing that today. And then how we can run different types of other types of analysis, such as tsunami, regional site response using the soil column under a structure. And the idea is all these examples come prepackaged in R2D, and you can just go to the menu bar, select examples, pick the ones you want, load it. And you could use that as a starting point for your analysis going forward. So you could pick the one that most similarly resembles the type of research question you want to answer, and then build it up from there, change that inventory, change the hazard, but you know, keep the general kind of workflow. <clears throat> and note that many of these examples are watered down test beds. So you'll, you'll see a few thousand buildings here, but we have test beds that are hundreds of thousands, of millions of assets that you know, we've run on the supercomputer. So it's quite powerful the amount of uh, assets you can run. And here I mentioned you can run jobs remotely and locally. So if they're small simulation jobs, uh, you know, you might want to run them on your personal computer, kind of set up the analysis, and then you could take all the buildings and run them on TAC, you know, if you want to save on electricity costs. Uh, TAC is a supercomputer out in Texas. This is me. I was at TAC last November. And it's quite an amazing facility, and it's completely free. So you can run all your examples on TAC at the Design Safe servers, and it's a great tool, great option to have. Uh, recently, I've also implemented housing demographics. So say we have assets uh, like buildings or pipelines, and you want to figure out what population demographics those pipelines serve, or you know who lives in these houses. Uh, we, R2D has built in functionality to take the census information and automatically augment your asset inventory to include that. So you'll see here there's a percent white, percent black, percent Hispanic of the population that that lives in this census kind of area. And then you could use that to, to establish kind of a baseline for who lives in these houses and, and figure out who is most affected by different types of natural disasters. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna provide a demonstration now. So I'm gonna open up R2D and kind of walk through it a bit, show, show you how it looks, how it functions. And I'm going to simulate a hurricane, and then we're going to run a regional damage and loss simulation for a small subset of buildings uh, for that hurricane. So I'm going to turn this off now, and I'm going to bring up RTD. And hopefully you can see it now. So first thing I'm going to highlight this menu bar. This is kind of where you can access a different QJS functionality. So you notice here I can zoom in. You know, pan, zoom out, everything that you have in QGIS is kind of part of this platform here. Uh, if I go up here to GIS map in the menu bar, you'll notice that it's the QGIS menu <laughs> kind of just tucked in here and you, it, will, it will allow you to access say their documentation and their different functionalities that, that's available in QGIS. And going back to RTD, here's that examples uh, menu as well. So it, you can download the different examples you want. Uh, here, and then they'll appear here in this list, and you can load an example, which I'm going to do now, I'm going to load example hurricane wind, which I'm going to use later on in this presentation, but just to give you an idea of how it looks. So this is Lake Charles. 
And if I zoom in here, you'll, you'll notice this raster, which is a hurricane wind field. Speed's going from about 90 to 141 miles an hour. And if I zoom in, you'll see the building inventory. And in this case, there are, let's see how many, 26,500 buildings. So about 27,000, let's say, buildings here. And you'll notice everything's at the parcel level granularity. So it allows you to go analyze building by building. And when you send this off to the supercomputer by clicking on the, the run at design safe button, I'm just gonna log in here quickly. So you give it a job name, you, you, know, you select the buildings you want, you say the number of nodes, you don't wanna request too much nodes because then it might wait in queue forever, but you wanna give it a few nodes, a number of processors per node, so you can go up to I think 60 something, uh, and the number of uh, buildings per task. So what this means is, so you have 64 processors and you have one node, it's gonna run 64 parallel tasks, if you will. And at each task, it's gonna have 10 buildings, like a small batch of buildings is gonna analyze one by one until they're all done and then combine the results at the end. So everything is run kind of embarrassingly parallel. So the more nodes you have, you could scale up to run you know, thousands of structures at once. And then when you're done, you could just click on get from design safe, your jobs will appear here. You could right click, say retrieve data, and it's gonna suck it right back, right back into RTD. Uh, now let's go through some of these panes here just to give you a general idea how this looks. Uh, or, or sorry, before I go that, I wanna focus on one more menu item here. So there's tools. This, this is where the tool section is in RTD. This is that census data allocation that I kind of talked about previously where you can select a layer and then download the different census data to, to augment that layer with. There's the earthquake scenario simulation where it allows you to simulate an earthquake. I won't spend too much time there. And then there's the hurricane scenario simulation. So this is the one that we're gonna run today. We're gonna create a grid, import a hurricane, do all that, and then, and then create a wind field. But I'll get to that in a second. You can also load results that have already been done. Uh, you can clear the inputs and that's about it. And load also examples that you create using a file open. So I'm just gonna step through here, give you a rough idea of the different types of panes. So here's a general information pane. Like I said, it's very high level, just the name, the units, the different types of assets you wanna include and the granularity of your output settings. So you could output every realization of every EDP, of every damage measure, of every DV, and you get a lot of data. So you want to, if you're running a million buildings, you might want to be sparse and just perhaps get the, the final output. Uh, this is where we define the hazard. So you'll see here is a raster defined hazard. What, when we run a hurricane simulation, it's going to be a user specified hurricane. What that means is we're going to have a grid. In Steve, I think you're frozen. Sorry, I think uh, I lost everyone in my back. Yes. Oh, perfect. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Hopefully you can see the screen again. I'm not sure where I lost you. <laughs> Was it right here, somewhere around asset definition? Yeah, okay. So here's where we define our asset. Here I'm using well, a general like general information, I guess. Oh, I lost I lost your general information? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'll quickly go through this again and then I'll go for it. So general information is where we give it a, a name, units, the type of assets, and then the different output settings. So this is essentially the granularity of the output, whether you want the every realization of every damage variable, every EDPDM. So for re really large analyses, you wanna keep this sparse and perhaps just output only, only the results at the end. Uh, 
here's where we define the hazard in the hazard pane. You'll remember that I said this was a, a raster or a TIFF image. So this is a hurricane uh, for TIFF. I'll show you how to create that grid, which will be a user specified hurricane. And essentially all that is, is you define a grid in CSV like Excel and each grid point you define the wind speeds or ten different intensity measures. And I'll show how that looks. And then we have our asset definition. Uh, this is, I'm using a GIS file, so a geo package to import my Lake Charles building inventory. You can also have a CSV file where each row is a building and each column is an attribute. Uh, and that this is how it'll look again if it was a CSV file. But here I take a geo package or a GIS file and, and do convert it into a table. Again, each row here is an asset and then you'll, you'll notice the different types of attributes we have available for these assets. And you might not have all these for your building inventory, uh, but in this case, we have year built, you know, roof slope, mean roof height, and so on and so on. Uh, this is the hazard to asset. So how do we link our hazard to our asset? This case is site specified, but there's also nearest neighbor. And what site specified means is if I zoom into my site here, it's gonna sample this raster at the centroid of my polygon, or if it's a point, just at the point to get the intensity measure, in this case, the wind speed. Uh, and have a grid, which I'll show. And then instead of sampling, you know, can't sample the grid, you'll just try to find the nearest neighbor or nearest neighbors. So you can sample from two, four, five, however many nearest neighbors you want and kind of average that out and, and get the intensity measure. And then we have our modeling. We're not doing any modeling in this case. Uh, it's just gonna be IM. So we're taking our intensity measure and using that as our engineering demand parameter. And then for our damage and loss, we're using Pelican, which is this, perhaps you've heard of it before. It's a, our damage and loss module at the Sim Center. And you'll see there's different types of methodologies. We're using the Hazus MH Hurricane today. And we're also using this auto populate script, which takes, takes the attributes from the buildings and assigns it to a particular type of fragility function. So you may or may not use this, but it's pretty powerful if you do. Essentially in this Python script, it's just a rule set uh, where let's say my building is, or my roof style is hip. Well, then I'm gonna use this fragility function. If my roof style is a flat, then I'm gonna use this fragility function. So you just make these rules to, to tell R2D or to tell Pelican which fragility function you wanna use based on this asset. So for each asset, it's gonna run the script and then figure out the, the fragility function going forward. And then UQ and RV, I won't spend too much time there because uh, there aren't quite supported fully yet. And then the results will show up once we, once we. Okay, so I'm gonna clear this example eight and I'm gonna open an example I created for today, which is called the GSC example. And it's essentially example eight, but without the hazard, you'll see the hazard failed to, to read, which means there's no hazard here. I only have my building inventory. So there's nothing here under hazard. So we're gonna create the hazard today. Uh, I'm gonna go to tools now, and I'm gonna go to hurricane scenario simulation, and I'll see my JS screen again, but now I have these other uh, selection items up here, and you'll notice it's kind of a pop-up. I have two screens, so sometimes things might pop up on another screen. But I'm gonna select the hurricane from a database. So I'm gonna go up here to hurricane definition, select from database, and I'm gonna load the hurricane database. So now I loaded every hurricane that, that's occurred in the last three years as part of the NOAA IB tracks kind of database. It's built into RTD. So you could click that, you'll notice some of these hurricanes run across the map. That's why these lines do that. But once I zoom in, they go away. So I'm gonna zoom into my building here and you'll notice that there's a hurricane that runs very close right through pretty much Lake Charles. And that's Hurricane Laura. So we'll use that one. Uh, I'm gonna select this hurricane. And then I'm going to zoom out and you'll notice that this is kind of the only one left there. And you'll notice each track point and this kind of blue diamond here that specifies the landfall location. So using that database, R2D will figure out where the first landfall is. You'll have some hurricanes that make landfall twice. So you may want to change your landfall. You might want to clear it here and then define the landfall again somewhere. And, you know, perhaps want to do that. But in this case, I'll leave it the same. It's very simple. It'll pull the landfall values from the database that you need. 
so we got our track, we got our landfall. Now the only thing missing is their grid. So we're going to zoom in here. And I click on define grid on map. And I see this little grid widget thing pops up. So I want my grid to cover my assets and I want it to be uh, fine enough so that I can, let me zoom out there here. So I have a decent wind field. That they don't all sample from the same point. So I'm gonna increase the divisions here to 25 in each direction. And now you'll see there's some, something's there. And I'm gonna click on select grid and the grid is created for me. So when I click on run now, at each site, it's going to give me three peak wind speeds, so three intensity measures. Uh, and but first, we got to run it, so that's what I'm going to do now. And we're just going to leave it at three. I'm going to leave everything as is. And then I, I think I click the run button. Yeah, it's running. So it's running now. I'm going to close this. And it says here running script and background. We'll give it a few seconds. And we're done. Okay. I'm going to zoom back into the hurricane grid. And I'm going to identify, and you'll notice the peak wind speed. Now, we do have a bug here that's going to be fixed on the next release. You'll notice that these wind speeds are a lot lower than what was shown in that raster. So again, this is going to be fixed on the next release, but it won't change the workflow. Everything you see here will, will stay the same. Just these results will be more, more representative. So as I click on each green point, you'll notice that the wind speeds change. And you could sample many wind speeds. Uh, now we want to use this track in our analysis. So I'm going to show you how this looks. So I'm going to go here to RTD. Uh, everything is done in your kind of work directory, what we say. So your remote work directory is where you'll download and upload things from Design Safe and local, where I ran now, is where you'll run these little local kind of assessments. And in this temp sim center folder is where the actual analyses are run. And in this hazard simulation folder, this is where these different hazard simulations occur. So as I said before, I could simulate a, a ground motion. And in this case, I simulated a hurricane. So I'm gonna click on hurricane and then on output. And you'll notice I got a whole lot of CSV files. So at each one of these points, a CSV file was created. And if I go down to the bottom, you'll, you'll see this is an important file called event grid. I'm gonna bring that up to you see how it looks. So each one of these is a, a ground motion, or not ground motion, a station, I should say, station file. And each one has a latitude and longitude. And if I click on one of these files, let's see, 640, you'll notice there's uh, a header at the top. This is peak wind speed, and then each sample or each intensity measure for that station. And you can have more than one intensity measure. Uh, like peak inundation height, so on and so on, depending on what type of analysis you're running. And then you can have many samples to kind of introduce some uncertainty into the picture. But now I'm going to take everything here, but let me first bring up this GSC example folder. So this is how the, the folder looks for this example that I'm running. You notice there's an input JSON file. This is the one created by R2D uh, that's then fed into the back end. Uh, this is how it looks. So, you know, uh, this is easier for a computer to read than, than a human. So I won't spend too much time here. But it's essentially a JSON file that sets up the analysis and how, how it's going to run, run in the back end. And in this input data for, folder, there's an intensity measures or IMs folder that is now empty. So I'm going to copy this into here. And it might take a second to zoom. Ah, there we go. So that's loading that now. And now R2D knows where to look, uh, where to find this grid. So I'm going to close this and close this. And then let's load this new example now. I'm going to clear everything. You don't have to, but just to show how that looks. Open GSC example input.json. So there we go. Now we have a hazard. This is that grid we just ran, created. And we're going to now run how many buildings? Let's see. So I have here a filter of 20 buildings. So I just did the ID from 1 to 20, just to keep life easy. And I'm going to click Run now. So now we're running the simulation on 20 buildings locally. This is on my computer. If I was to click on Run a Design Safe, 
I would fill out those few things, click upload, and that's it. I'd be done. I'd go have a sandwich, have a coffee, come back. I'd check here if my analysis is done, and then bring it back in. So now we're running it locally. Uh, and we'll have to wait a few seconds here. And you'll notice in the bottom, there's a elapsed timer telling you how much has passed. There's also a progress bar. And now it's cycling through each building, running a, an analysis, picking the proper fragility function, calculating the loss ratio, I believe. Yeah, so here we have a loss ratio and the repair cost is almost the exact same thing. Uh, it is the exact same thing because we have no value to the building, it's just a loss. And you'll notice the very low losses, which makes sense. We only have 60 mile an hour winds, so they're almost non-existent. If I go here to loss ratio, you'll notice it's very small. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna load example eight, which is the same one, but it uses the more proper uh, raster, so the hurricane wind field. And I'm gonna run, I believe it's at the same, same buildings, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna run this again. And now it's gonna sample at each building. It's gonna sample the raster, get the intensity measure, and then send that back to the back end for analysis. And we'll hopefully notice when this is done that we'll have some actual losses that occur. And again, you'll notice the, the wind speed varies from about 90 to 141 miles an hour. So quite larger than the 60 to 70 we had before. Again, that's a bug that will be fixed. Okay, there we go. Now if I expand this, you'll notice we have a loss ratio up to almost 70% on some of our buildings. It's a lot, a lot more varied, a lot more jagged. Uh, and let's go back here. Let's turn this off. And let's see here. What do I wanna show next? Maybe we'll go back here. Uh, no, no, we'll go back here. Okay, <clears throat> next I wanna highlight the different filtering functionality. So you'll notice <clears throat> there's two layers here, or there was, there's one called selected buildings, and then there's our main building layer. So if I click here and I go to show feature count, you only notice there's 20. So I don't necessarily analyze all my buildings at once. I need to select the ones I wanna analyze. Uh, and there's 20 out of how many do we say there was before? 26,500. Uh, and we might not wanna analyze the same ones every time. So what we can do is we can go here and apply a filter. So I'm gonna turn this off and I'm gonna go right click on the layer, the main building layer for our entire inventory. I'm gonna click on filter. And then this query builder will pop, will pop up kind of what is standard in QJS if you used it before. And you notice now all my fields for that particular layer appear here on my left. So let's click on roof shape and then go sample. You'll notice all the roof shapes that appear in my entire inventory will come up here. And I may wanna say, hmm, let's, let's first analyze all uh, assets that have a gable roof. So I'm gonna click on roof shape equals Gable and click test and 11,357 rows. So of all my 26,000 buildings, uh, about 11,400 have gable roofs. I click on okay and you'll notice it looks a lot sparser now, the building inventory. So, but almost half have gable roofs. So now we can add these, you know, select all these buildings, add them to our analysis, click run or send it off to the HPC and we'll have a you know, loss distribution of the buildings that have gable roofs. Now I wanna come back here, say, no, I don't want gable roofs anymore. I'm gonna clear that. I'm gonna click on roof shape equals flat, right? And if I go test, you'll notice there's 3000 buildings with flat roofs. Okay, now I have flat roofs. I could run all my, all my assets with the flat roof and, and then compare the two. See, see what difference roof shape makes in Hurricane Laura, right? What, what, how would I have fared better if my roof shape was a little different? And we could go to different types of building classes, occupancy classes. If we have, uh, if I included say the census information here, we could look at low-income houses, run those, and then compare how they 
Rent versus high income houses to see the disparity between different types of the population. So it's quite powerful where you can go through the different types of fields, choose the assets you want to run, and then send those forward off into, a, into an analysis. And I'm going to clear, clear this filter quickly and showcase kind of another little feature. So let's say I'm concerned about a particular region here as well. So I could zoom in on that and I could click on select. I could highlight certain buildings. I can add certain building, you know, the ones that are interest me, like maybe hospitals or schools, or I don't know, some particular community that I feel should be analyzed. And then when I click add assets, those assets will be added to the list here. And uh, I can go forward and, and analyze those. And then I also wanna highlight the main difference between this example eight and Iran, which is just pretty much example eight, but with that hurricane grid, is that, as I mentioned before, example eight uses a raster and in this hazard to asset kind of application, you'll notice it says site specified, which means it, at each site, it will sample the raster and get the IM. And this other one, if I go to say file open, so I'm gonna open the one with the grid now. And you can make this grid fairly high resolution too. Uh, it, it's up to you. If you, you saw how quick it was for this 25 by 25 grid. You can make it quite, you know, quite fine. Uh, and I can go here now and you'll see it's nearest neighbor, which allows me to sample uh, a number of neighbors randomly and take how, how many samples from those neighbors. So, so remember before I had a list of intensity measures at each point, if I click here, You'll see there's three wind speeds and it'll just go around your neighbors sampling these different wind speeds to get some you know statistical idea of your intensity measure using the, the nearest neighbor approach and yeah all these points are correlated of course so you, you know you, you should go to the different neighbors and have similar values and what else do i want to mention here Great disaster. I think I showed everything for the yeah so any questions let's open up to questions now uh, I'll leave this open so in case there's any r2d questions and then we can go back to the slide for more general questions I'll just have one slide left to show uh, regarding the, the forum uh, I have a question yeah shoot. Yeah, so uh, like uh, like I was using like the hazard uh, tool of like FEMA. So I mean, uh, can you please please like tell me that what is the difference between I mean hazards and this R two D tool? Okay, so that comes into say damage and loss. So the difference here is it we use the same or similar I would say fragility functions as hazards. So it won't be much difference there, but you'll notice there's something here called user provided fragility. So let's say I have, I'm a researcher, I wanna create my own fragility functions for earthquakes now, uh, and I don't wanna use the hazardous ones, or perhaps I wanna compare to hazardous, which I have here, but I have my own fragility function. Say I designed a fragility function for the three different roof types. So I have one for hip, gable, flat. Uh, I have auto population script, which I'm going to sit, which it will use my, it'll find my fragility functions in this folder and automatically be available in the script. And it'll allow me to select my fragility functions now and use that in a regional analysis. So I'm not just stuck with hazards. Um, you know, I can create my own fragility functions or use another researcher's fragility functions as well. Uh, like here's an example. If I load example nine tsunami. This one, I believe, uses that. Yeah, so I use custom fragilities from Incor. So from the NIST center there, Incor, I take their fragility function and I use them here to run a tsunami analysis on this column of buildings. So like, like in Hazus, you know, like uh, in Hazus, you know, we used to import the like depth grid from the, uh, uh, from the like, uh, uh, from FEMA website, like like for the okay. floods. So like this tool, like you know, you did like I mean, imported the depth grids for the hurricane or other like uh, <laughs> hazards. Yeah. So I mean, like I can analyze like in this for the 
floods are also like like using the flood crits uh, death crit from the FEMA. Yes. Well, you have to convert it into SimCenter format first. So if you you can write a script that takes say the FEMA grid, and then if you put it into that same format I showed you or I showed previously, mm -hmm. where you have the event grid file that has each kind of ground point flat long, and then each ground point is its own CSV file with different columns for however many intensity measures you have or attributes, whatever. Uh, you can use it here. So, so it doesn't support, say, the FEMA map per se. I don't know what format the FEMA map is in. If it's in GIS format, then we also have this uh, GIS desert where you can. Yeah, it has like dot uh, dot diff like files. Oh yes. So if it's a raster, then you can you can. Yeah, raster. Yeah, it's a raster file. Okay. So we have a raster defined. So in this case, the tsunami is a TIFF, right? I have my okay. inundation depth as a TIFF file. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. So I see that Richard um, has his hand up, and then we also have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, I have a, uh, I guess a few questions. Um, in in your in the list at the beginning, at the very end, you had a recovery. Is that built into this as well? Yeah. So you might be familiar with Ready at Arup. So I'm working to bring ready open source. I'm creating an open source package and I'm gonna be implementing it into the RTD, like the recovery module. And then we have two or three other recovery modules that are currently being implemented. They're not done yet, but recovery is in progress, put it that way. I see, I so see. It's coming and, down the pipeline. And the other thing you mentioned is, uh, I, we didn't do it here, but you, you said you can do modeling as well. Um, Yes. What kind of modeling does this accept? Yeah, so let me go to example four. This is where I used to live in the university village here at UC Berkeley. If I go to modeling now, you'll notice there's an OpenSea's Pi script generator. And I create a, essentially a Python script. This is just creates a cantilever. And all the information in this asset, in this asset definition table is available to every app, every, I should say, method or model downstream. So if I have something here that describes my building inventory, like occupancy class, structural type, uh, I'm gonna have it available downstream. And I just use that in the script called cantilever light. I say, if my building is three stories high, I create a little open seas pi finite element model. Uh, if it's concrete, I use this material. If it's steel, I use that material. So there's different ways for you on the fly to create these finite element models for pretty much an entire region, depending on some basic building attributes. So is this only limited to buildings then? Currently only buildings, uh, but you know what? I've never tried it on other types of infrastructure, but it, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Like what type of infrastructure are you well, I'm, I'm thinking of transmission and uh, distribution systems for electrical components, for electrical. So like power poles and power lines. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see why, why you couldn't. You just create your own script that has the specific, it will have those attributes or, you know, those columns and the asset definition available. And then you could create your own OpenSea's Pi model. Uh, so currently we support OpenSeas and OpenSeas Pi. Uh, I'm not sure if there's other types of analysis. Yeah. And uh, and so if you do, I don't know, for example, you do do that electrical grid model, you can make your own fragility curves, implement them here. Can you also change or implement your own intensity measurements with those fragility curves or how does it work in this? Yeah, so your your intensity measures are supplied through your hazard definition, right? Your intensity measure field. Uh, and that, that is available downstream. So say I get to my analysis stage, I have my intensity measure, obviously. I have my model that comes from the model stage, and now I could combine the two. And I, I'm not sure what you mean by, perhaps you, you want to augment your intensity measures based on some model parameters. Is that what you're saying? So yeah, mm -hmm. you can do it. You can do it at this step here. Uh, it'll just have to be some custom Oh, I see. Up to you to, to make that. We haven't gotten that far yet for other types of infrastructure. For buildings right now, it's kind of seamless because OpenSeas Pi, OpenSeas is kind and, of and I guess, the standard for that. 
the last big question is, um, uh, it, it, what other hazards will be implemented into this? Um, so uh, currently we have, what did I say? We got earthquake, tsunami, hurricane, and flood, I think is the last one that we're looking at okay. to implement in the near future. Uh, but what other hazards would you be interested in, like temperature or what? What would be your... I think a lot of people are now focusing on wildfires. So wildfires, yeah. yeah that's one. So I roughly I would deal with wildfires, but it hasn't come up yet at the Sin Center. Like it's been in discussion, but I don't think we thank you ha have it on our. So um, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, so uh, Shen asks if you have the building inventory for the entire United States. So we don't, but others have it. And uh, if it's in GIS format or CSV format, we can we can bring it in. So we are working. I'm the wrong person to answer this question. I know we have been working on because there's the building inventory working group, which I'm not part of. Uh, but we are working on that, getting some sort of building inventory database. Uh, but that's not really in our purview. It's just we're kind of combining the different databases out there that are available and hopefully you know we can guide you to the to the right one but if you have a building inventory out there that's typically in gis format or any type of gis format you can upload it and use it quite easily i mean but, gis format like you mean by like geo package files like that can be also geo package shape geo json Esri, okay. like any type of GIS. Is because uh, yeah because an assignment to using like the, they have the like geo packages and QJS ones. That's fine. Yeah. Any any like anything that QJS uses, which is almost anything in the GIS okay. world, RTD, okay. RTD can load and use and par. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have another question in the chat asking uh, what methodology you're using to estimate wind speeds, um, such as height above ground or terrain. Are you using hazardous methods for um, estimating surface roughness? So that's a great question. And again, I don't think I'm 100% qualified to answer that one because I didn't implement this hurricane scenario simulation. Uh, and there's no citation here, which there usually is. Uh, but I do know we have, so if I go here to specify hurricane track, there is a terrain roughness geojson. It just uses a I think open terrain now to be conservative. Uh, this is based on, God, I wish I, I remembered this. I'll get back to you on that question for sure. I can, if you want to shoot me an email, I can get back to you. Uh, but I believe yeah, that was some... me. That would be. I'll. I can shoot you an email because I am really curious to be able to compare my models with what y'all have just to do some um, estimating. Benchmarking, yeah, for sure. That'd be great. Because uh, yeah. Quan Chi Zhang, he developed the the wind field simulation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then we have another question um, asking if it's possible to predict um, loss of assets or property under certain levels of hazards or in certain damage states. Um, this person is interested in potentially uh, adding a policy context where this type of software could be useful when presented to um, FEMA or other um, uh, emergency. Uh, managers. Okay, can you repeat the first part of the question? I missed the. Yes, the they ask if it's possible to predict the loss of assets or property under certain uh, levels of hazard or in certain damage states. I'm not sure I understand it 100%. So, under certain levels of. Rahendra, do you want to speak up and maybe clarify your question? Yeah, I would like to ask you questions. Uh, may we predict the losses of property or assets in mm -hmm. a certain level of risks? Uh, I, mean, I mean, hazards level. We can then we may validate uh, those losses for for the future mitigation measures. Yeah, yeah. So what what you can do is you could scale your hazard. Nothing stopping you there. Like you can go into say the hazard definition and. Let's take this one I have now, for example. Oh, this isn't a good one, but let me load. 
uh, let's do this one, basic as is. So this is just a quick earthquake example of San Francisco. And the grid will pop up in a second, but there's nothing stopping you from creating different levels of hazard. Let's say a low intensity earthquake and a high intensity earthquake. And then you subject it to different types of assets and then you can compare those results at the end. So one useful feature here is you can, you can select, let's say I run this analysis, I can click run. I hope it'll be done in time. Uh, you'll know, a layer pops up with the loss ratios, everything here. I can right click that. I can go to export, save features as, and then I could save that as a, as a shape file or any type of, you know, this huge selection here, let's say geo package. And I can have, you know, four or five, let's say results and then combine them in another GIS platform like QGIS to see, to see those differences like, like you were talking about and perhaps how they impact low income, let's say residents. And then you could forward that on to policymakers, but it would require some post processing, like like I described. So you can run an analysis, save save your results, and then and then you know post process it down the line. So hopefully, answer your question. <laughs> if not, if not, you know, we can talk offline. Okay, sure. Uh, Rakesh, you've had your hand up very patiently for some time now, if you want to ask your question. Yeah, I, I guess this was already discussed when Stephen answered a prior question, but uh, I was going to ask about whether an R2D tool uh, supports analysis by other assets, like infrastructure assets, like bridges, retaining structures, or dams, and things like that. If not, is there any plan to provide support for such assets in the future? Yes, yes, uh, another great question. Uh, as was mentioned at the very start, I worked on this other program called Open SRA, which is uh, specifically designed for natural gas pipelines. And that's being launched at the end of March, kind of officially going open source. And that's essentially R2D that's been modified to work just on natural gas pipelines to make it easy. It's sponsored by the California Energy Commission and it's intended for uh, natural gas company, like energy companies in California to use that to do the risk assessment on their inventory. So that's coming into RTD. We have water pipelines that are done, but not polished enough, I'd say yet for release. So very soon we're gonna have water networks, uh, natural gas networks, we have building, and then there are plans to bring in elect electric transmission systems. Uh, and then transportation is kind of the last thing on our list, but, for dams and stuff, not yet. I don't think there's been a demand that big for dams. But yeah, we're open to collaboration. <laughs> you know, everything's open source. It's there if you want to implement your own dam uh, assets and fragility functions and create your own example using dams. That'd be great. And we, we'd help you. I'd be happy to help you along the way. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, you have a lot of a lot of questions here. This is fantastic. There's a few more in the chat, if you don't mind. No um, these will, these will probably be the last ones that we that we'll be able to get to this session. Um, so the first question is asking if there are any vulnerabilities uh, to the data regarding demographics or loss predictions. So by vulnerability vulnerabilities, uh, what does that mean? So sorry, I don't I don't understand. Yeah. Jasmine, do you want to clarify what you mean by your question? Hi, yes. Um, so I just mean from like a privacy and security perspective, um, you know, the data that is collected like regionally, is there any type of um, vulnerability to the exposure of that data? Uh, so it's completely data that's available off census. So it's, I query the government API. So it's public. It doesn't like, you know, go from household to household and say this person makes this much, this person lives here. It's on a like census block level, I believe. So okay. it's anonymous data. But what, what we do is we take that anonymous data, like the statistics, and then you can create a profile, let's say a, a household profile, saying in this house we estimate that, you know, 20% of people are Hispanic. And then you, you roll the dice and for each house, you kind of assign a family, if you will, or a population. Great, thank you for that. Yes, 
So there's no personally identifying information. Yes, thank you. Uh, this this may be the last question that we can get to. Uh, Vincent, I want to encourage you to um, maybe email um, Steve your question following this session. Um, so Javed asks if it's possible to analyze um, impacts from multiple hazards at the same time, for example, examining compound hazards. Yeah, that's a great question. So we're working on that, but not currently. Like uh, in the tsunami example, you know, you not only have damage from the earthquake on the building, but then the tsunami comes right after that and impacts those damaged buildings. So that's not input. Compound hazards aren't implemented yet, but uh, it's it's in the works. Uh, it's you know very complex problem. And also Thank for you. yeah, sorry. Also for earthquakes as well, we've tried uh, to run workflows where you have one earthquake and then use it as damaged buildings, kind of in the second, say aftershock. It's not released yet in an easy to use kind of package, I would say, compound hazard. Thank you so much for answering all of these questions, Steve. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen just to wrap us up, if that's okay. All right, just give me one more second. I just wanna show- Yeah, the, absolutely. The final slide. So we have a forum yeah. here. If you have any questions that I you know, didn't answer today or you think of another one, Feel free to go to the forum here, the regional hazard simulation, or I believe that's one for RTD. Uh, and yeah, ask a question and you know, we'll get answered by someone. <laughs> so thank you. I stopped sharing now. Thank you. So um, I want to thank everybody for attending today's workshop. This was an incredibly interactive one, and we are so thankful for our uh, speaker, Steve, as well as all of the participants who attended today. I'd like to invite all of you to join us next month at the next and final workshop, part five of the workshop series, um, where we'll be discussing data integration using relational databases and application programming interfaces with Scott Brandenburg from UCLA. So that will be at the same time, second Friday of the month, March 10th at 11 a.m. Central Time. I just wanted to thank um, our speaker, Stephen Gavrilovic from Berkeley and Sim Center, um, as well as all of the fabulous organizers who, without whom this workshop series would never have been possible. Um, though he's not named here, I also really want to thank Adam from Sim Center, who connected us with all of the fabulous facilitators that we've had uh, at these workshops. Um, finally, for those of you who may not be members or maybe members but not quite sure how to get involved, I'd like to invite you all to join the NERI GSC, and if you are already a member, to join a working group or several if you'd like to get involved. Um, this was a joint effort, as I mentioned, between the research working group and the uh, workshop and mentor. And is Am I getting the right workshop and mentoring? Um, working group. Um, but there are other fabulous working groups um, that are working on some initiatives this year. Um, finally, I would like to in, um, invite everybody to join um, and submit an abstract to the NERI GSC mini conference. Uh, these applications are due by February 24th, 2023. The QR code to submit an abstract, which is a limited to 500 words, uh, is at this link or at this QR code. And I'm happy to linger for a couple minutes if there are um, pertinent questions that I can answer. Um, and with that, I would just really like to thank all of you for joining us today, our speaker, uh, Stephen, and um, Hope to see you all at the next workshop on March 10th.